we're here in chapter 24, verses 33 through 43. So let's begin reading together here in Luke chapter 24. Let's begin reading together at verse 33. We'll read to verse 43 and uh, get into our study. Luke writes, So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Boo! <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> in the midst of him and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate in their presence." And so what we have here is a continuation of what we'd been looking at previous to this. We know that Jesus has been ministering. He's been ministering to two disciples as they were on their way to a city called Emmaus, a city that we're told was about seven miles outside of the city of Jerusalem. And, and as these two disciples had been walking on the road to Emmaus, Jesus had accompanied them, began to speak to them, questioned them, and then ministered to them and gave them biblical reasons for them to have hope in Him. And that's what He was doing. He was showing them from the Scriptures the things that were concerning Himself. You see, as He says this in verse 27, uh, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, He expounded to them in all the Scriptures the things concerning Himself. And, and the, the bottom line is, is that the, He wanted to point to the fact that Scripture points to Him. And that Scripture is fulfilled in him. Scripture is summed up in him. According to Romans chapter 10, verse 4, when Paul was writing on an occasion, he was speaking concerning Jesus, and, and he said, Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. When, when Paul said to the Roman church, Christ is the end of the law, the word end simply means he's the telos, he's the, he's the conclusion, he's what the law is pointing to. So, Scripture points to the Lord Jesus Christ. Scripture is summed up in Him. In the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 10, uh, it, it reads, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so, the Lord Jesus Christ is found in Scripture is the point that He's making. And so, He went from Moses, He went into the prophets, and He expounded uh, to them in all the Scriptures the things that were concerning Himself. And, and so he was ministering to them out of the Word of God. And, and as he gave this particular study, their eyes were opened, and according to verse 31, they recognized him, they knew him. And at that point, he vanished from their sight. So his teaching opened their eyes. When it says their eyes were opened, it simply means to open the mind or to cause someone to understand something. His teaching opened them up so that they could understand. They could understand the plan of God. And the only way that somebody can understand the plan of God is if God opens their eyes to it. There are a lot of people who go to church. They go to church sometimes their whole life and never really do understand what the plan of God is. They're, they're never really convicted of, uh, of their own life. They're not awakened to the need for God. They're, they're simply there in church. But, but when God opens your eyes, you begin to understand. So that's what it's all about. And the Bible actually begins to make sense. And the things that are said begin to actually apply to you. And you begin to realize that that this isn't just a book, this is a book of life. These are instructions that, that the Lord gives to us so that we might know how to be blessed by Him and to please Him. And, and that's what happens. God opens your eyes to these things, and that's what Jesus did. He opened their eyes. You see, if God doesn't open your eyes, you remain blind. You remain blind to His plan. You remain blind to who Jesus Christ is. And as a result of that, you'll continue walking in spiritual blindness. Paul, when he was writing to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, said this. He said, even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. There is a spiritual blindness that people have prior to God opening their eyes. 
God does so through his convicting Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks to you and awakens you to the reality of your lost condition. He awakens you to the fact that you don't know the Lord. He convicts you. He convinces you. He makes it real. He, he says, this is who I am, and this is what you believe, and what you believe and who I am are two different things, and so you need to align with me. And when he does that, you open your heart to him, and you commit yourself to him, that veil is removed. And that's what happened. So when Jesus opened their eyes, they began to speak to one another, and, and they said how their hearts had, had burned within them. Because what happened is, as he had opened the word to them, a, a spiritual fire was ignited within them, and, and they had a recognition as to who he is. And so that's what was taking place in the verses previous to what we're looking at tonight. And so in verse 33, continuing that, it says, So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were uh, with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And so that very moment, that minute that their eyes were opened up, they, they took off. They went down to Jerusalem and, and they found the eleven. So they didn't keep this news to themselves. They didn't want to just hold it. They, they weren't afraid of bothering people. They actually took that news and, and shared it. That's what happens, by the way, when you get saved. Um, I, I realize today that it's not politically correct to actually share your faith with people. I realize that people get offended because you tell them about God and what God can do in a person's life. And, and I know that people get upset over uh, evangelical Christians going out and actually trying to convert people to faith in Jesus Christ. But, but you know what? When God does something in your life, you can't help but talk about it. You just can't help but, but do that. You, you can't help yourself. I mean, it's just something you have to do. You know, it's kind of like where Jeremiah at one point, in the, Old, in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, he said that he made a determination that he wouldn't speak anymore in the name of God. He says, but when I tried to be quiet, I couldn't keep my mouth shut. He said it was like a fire that burned within me. I had to speak. There's just something about that. There are many times that I've been in a, in a classroom situation or in a place that I haven't been asked to speak, and I've been there, and um, there's conversations going on, discussion going on, and there have been many times when I have just kind of sat there and I've kind of folded my hands and I've kind of just, you know, I've listened to what's being said. And, and before you know it, I, my body actually vibrates. It actually is a physical reaction that takes place in me. I actually begin to, to quiver. My mom saw that numerous times. Um, she finally learned that, that, that oh, oh, this guy's going to say something. She finally learned that. Because I would, I would stand there, you know, a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon would come to the door, mom, mom would be there, and she'd see me answer the door, and she'd see me starting to get agitated. And I actually, literally, when I was younger, I would start just moving. I, you know, I, it's like, oh, oh, here it goes. It's going to come out. You know, get out of the way. It's going to boom, and it would come out. And it just, I couldn't hold it back. I just, there's just something about that. And, you know, when, especially when you're new in the Lord, you want to share with people, and, and prayerfully that remains with you all the rest of your walk with Jesus Christ, this desire to talk about Jesus and to encourage people to know him. And you know, Why? Because God loves them, because God will forgive give them of their sins because God can transform their life. God can give them hope and peace and joy. He can give them love. He can do so much. And you want to see the transformation take place in them that has taken place in you. And, and you can't keep it to yourself. And that's what happened with these disciples. The Lord opened the Word of God to them. And as He opened the Word of God to them, they couldn't keep it to themselves. So they immediately go to Jerusalem and, and they're rushing into where the disciples are, where the apostles and and, uh, and uh, believers, other believers are, and that's what it says in verse 33. They returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together. But as they're walking in and they're wanting to share with them what has happened, the interesting thing is, is that God has already been moving amongst them. Now, when it says in verse 33, the eleven were gathered together with those who were with them, the 11, just so that you know this, and because I'm going to develop this with you in, in a moment here, the 11 is actually what you would call a technical term. You might want to note that in your memory. The phrase the 11 is a technical term. It, it's a, a term that refers to the apostles. Originally, they were the 12, but Judas, through treachery, gave up his position as an apostle. And so, Luke is referring to the apostles, what has been called the apostolic band, as the 11. And so that's a technical term that refers to the apostles. You see that in Mark 16, 14, where it says, later he appeared to the 11 as they sat at table. 
or, or earlier in Luke 24, verse 9, they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Uh, later on in the book of Acts, when the apostle Peter stands up to preach, it says in Acts 2, verse 14, that Peter's standing up with the eleven. And what that's a reference to, it's a term that speaks of the apostles. And so, what you have here is you have the apostles gathered together. You have them gathered together with other believers. Now, what has kept them together has been the resurrection it's the resurrection of Jesus that makes them gather together. You see, when Jesus was arrested, the disciples had fled. But now that he's resurrected, he has actually drawn them back together. And, and, and that's what happens with us, by the way. The reason that we come together on Wednesdays and Sundays and whenever it is that we do is because the resurrection of Christ draws us back together. We gather together over the reality of the living Lord, and that's what was taking place there. And so as they enter in, they're wanting to share with them what has taken place. These, these two disciples on the road to Emmaus have, have come so they can share with them. Uh, but they're greeted with a saying that the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. So what happens is they enter into the room expecting to give some news, but the people who are in the room begin to give them news. They're greeted by joy, a joy-filled disciple. Disciples are already aware of Jesus' resurrection. It's interesting that when the women said that Jesus was alive, that was met with skepticism. Remember that in verse 11 when it says there in, in chapter 24 that these women, their words seemed to them like idle tales. They didn't believe them. But now they do believe. And it's interesting how it says in verse 34 how it says, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And so when Simon Peter testified they received this news, the news that Jesus Christ is alive. Jesus had appeared to, to Simon and had spoken to him. This is something that Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 5 makes reference to, but Jesus had appeared to him and Simon Peter had shared with the others and as he had shared with the others, they took his witness to heart. Now, why would he have appeared to Simon? I find it interesting to note that that's what it says here. It says, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Why would Jesus have appeared in this way to Simon? The answer is quite obvious. Simon needed reassurance because Simon Peter had failed the Lord. And so the Lord made a special visitation to this beloved disciple who had failed him. The Lord has a way of doing that. He has a way of ministering to us in the special areas of our need. We'll see that in a moment as we take a... A journey into John in just a moment. But this is what's taking place now. Notice, notice verse 35, and, and they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. And so the two disciples began sharing how Jesus had met with them and had opened up their eyes, and, and that's what they're sharing about. Now, as this is all taking place, verse 36, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that is, I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And so... Jesus is there now as they're talking, and he now appears in the midst of them, and he speaks to them and immediately says in verse 36, peace to you. Now, John gives us more information. In the Gospel of John in chapter 20, verses 19 and 20, John gives us some information that helps us to understand what is taking place here. In John chapter 20, verses 19 and 20, John writes, the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. His disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And so, they're together. They're rejoicing over the news that the Lord Jesus Christ is alive. 
They've gathered together over that. They're rejoicing over that. They're sharing over that. And yet, John gives us some insight. In the midst of their joy, they also have fear. They're afraid that the ones who came and took Jesus Christ and crucified him, those authorities, they're afraid that those same authorities will come and arrest them. And so they're there in their room with the doors closed, they're, they're locked, because they're afraid that somebody may come and take them. As this is taking place, Jesus is about to teach them a lesson. You see, earlier, uh, when Jesus had been arrested, he had protected his men. It, it, we're told in John 18, verses 7 through 9, when they came to take Jesus, that he had, he had asked those who were arresting him, whom are you seeking? And, and they said, Jesus of Nazareth, and Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke of those whom you gave me. I have lost none. So on the one hand, when Jesus was with them, they were safe. When Jesus was with them, nobody could harm them. But Jesus physically is no longer with them. And because Jesus is no longer with them physically, they now have fear. And so as they're gathering together, speaking about the events of the day, rejoicing over the report that Jesus Christ is alive, in the midst of that, Jesus comes and he stands in the midst and he says to them, peace unto you. Now, he doesn't knock on the door. He doesn't ask for them to, to open it up for him. He simply enters into the room. And obviously, as he enters into the room, it shakes them up and they need the peace that only he can give. Now, earlier, Jesus had promised them that they in him would have peace. And, and, and what he had said earlier was intended to keep them and strengthen them for what they were going to endure. But sadly, they had forgotten his word to them the way that we sometimes can too. You know, I can, I can remember all kinds of scriptures when I'm in a comfortable position, but I find myself sometimes getting a mental block when I'm under stress. And, and I know a lot of scriptures. I've read through the Bible and all kinds of things for many years. And, and yet, when I'm under duress, I, I can forget. I can forget what God had said. And, and that's what took place here. You see, earlier, Jesus in John 14, 27 had said to them, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. In John 16, verse 16, he said, A little while you will not see me. Again, a little while you will see me because I go to the Father. He had said, Listen, don't let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I'm going to the Father, but you're going to see me again. He'd already prepared them. He'd already made it clear this is going to take place. But under the stress and duress of that evening, under the fear and everything that, they're in, that they have at that moment, they're afraid. And so that's what's taking place. And so they're terrified. They think that they're seeing a spirit. Well, back in Luke 24, at first, verse 38, it says that Jesus says to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. A spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Now, it's interesting to me that, that though he says to them, peace to you, he also brings a word of rebuke because Mark tells us in chapter 16, verse 14, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And so Jesus actually brings a word of comfort, but he also brings a word of correction in the same conversation. And as he speaks and brings that forth to them, he's saying, listen, you need to believe what God has said. Now he gives to them evidence because in verses 39 and 40, he says, I want you to see my wounds. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. So he shows them his wounds. Well, why did he do that? Well, one, he already gave us the answer. A spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And verse 37 had said they were terrified and frightened, supposed that they'd seen a spirit. So one, why did he say you can, you can handle me and, and see that I'm, I'm, I'm real? Well, one, he just wanted them to know that it was really, really him. He wanted them to know that it was him and that they could have peace in him. But there's something else I want to point out to you. 
Why would Jesus Christ show him the wounds? Well, one of the things that I think a lot of people need to remember is the wounds that Jesus bore, the wounds that he had on his body, revealed to us the depth of sin and God's reaction to it. The depth of sin and God's reaction to it. Let me share with you for a couple moments. This has been on my heart, so I'll just kind of share it extemporaneously with you, but prayerfully it'll make some sense. When the Lord began working with the children of Israel, Moses was on that mountain meeting with God, and all of that lightning and smoke and all of that that was taking place on that mountain caused the children of Israel who were down, not in the mountain, Moses was there meeting with the Lord, it caused them to be afraid. They were deathly afraid of what was taking place. Moses was gone, and all they could see was the activity taking place on that mountain. And when Moses came down to the children of Israel, the children of Israel said to Moses, you go and talk to God because we don't want to. They were absolutely terrified. They were terrified to come into the presence of the living God. Moses had fellowship with God. God spoke to Moses face to face. He had communion with Moses. And, and when God originally called Moses, as Moses was there in the backside of the desert and he saw uh, this bush that was on fire but not being consumed by the fire, and, and Moses walks up to that that burning bush there, and he, he hears a voice of the Lord speaking to him. You know the story. Remove your shoes for you're standing on holy ground. You know, you're, you're, you're a man of the earth, is what God is saying. You're a man of flesh. Your feet are, are actively connected to the world. And God is saying, but I am not of this world. I am holy. You are not. Remove your shoes, that connecting point, that that typifies or symbolizes your earthiness and become aware of the fact that you're standing in the presence of a holy God. And so from the beginning, when the Lord begins to minister through Moses and to the children of Israel, he makes it very clear that he is a very holy God. And he makes it clear that, that man can't have a relationship with him outside of him making it possible for that to take place. You see that through the Old Testament. You see that as you read through your Old Testament from Genesis to the, the last book, the book of Malachi. You see God revealing himself in incredible ways to people. You see in the book of Isaiah. You see how that Isaiah is a prophet. He is appointed by God to go out to the, to the nation and to share with them and to speak the mind of God to them. And, and when you read Isaiah and you get to chapter 5, you see that he's already a prophet. He's speaking to the children of Israel. And, and a variety of times, many times in chapter 5, he, he addresses the nation and he says to them, woe unto you, and then he gives to them all of these pronouncements of, of the things that God is not pleased with and what they're doing. Woe unto you that call bitter sweet and sweet bitter. Woe unto you call darkness light and light darkness. And, and he speaks to them and he's saying, God, God is, uh, is upset with the way that you are and the things that you're doing. And, and so you see him in chapter 5 bringing pronouncements. You, you see that all you need to do is read Isaiah chapter 5 over and over and over again. And you see this prophet Isaiah speaking to the children of Israel and he's saying to them, listen, God is upset at your behavior, but when you get to chapter 6, he begins to speak, and he says, in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord, and he was high, and he was lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And he begins to speak about what he saw. We all know that story in Isaiah chapter 6, how that, that there's smoke, and that there are these angels, angelic messengers of God, the seraphim, and they have six wings, two are covering their faces and two are covering their, their feet and they're flying and he sees this and, and he, he begins to become aware of the fact that even angels as, as, as incredible and as glorious as they are, even they cover their feet symbolizing that they are simply creatures in the presence of the most holy God. And as Isaiah is in the presence of God, the voice of the Lord begins to speak. 
Isaiah tells us that he became aware of the fact that he was, well, he said, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. This is a prophet called by God to live a lonely, isolated life with a message that people would reject. This is a man who was the premier righteous man of his day, a prophet going forth with a message to the nation, and yet when he had an opportunity to glimpse some of the holiness of God, his immediate response is, everything that I have said has not been as completely accurate as it could be as I see how holy God truly is. I realize that I'm an unclean man myself. And then this is interesting to me. The Lord wants to send him out to speak. Who, 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 who will go forth for me? Whom shall I send? And Isaiah says, here am I. Send me. God has one of the angels take a burning coal from the altar and that burning coal sears the lips of the prophet Isaiah. When you think about that, I've had hot coffee that's burned my tongue, but I have never had a burning coal sear my lips. Can you imagine the shock and pain of something like that? And yet, God allows that to take place in the life of Isaiah to purify his life because purity sometimes comes through, it can come through pain. And he's purified. Fast forward to the 21st century, and you will agree with me that there are very few people who have an appreciation of the holiness of God, even in the church. Even in the church. Even amongst those of us who who have been called by God to live lives that are separated unto him. The word holy simply means separated, to be separated unto the Lord. It is written, I am holy, therefore you be holy, saith the Lord. And yet, I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life when I have basically ignored the holiness of God because I want to enshroud God with one aspect, one thing, his grace, which I thank God for, course, I need his grace every day, but I have found that I could be guilty of using his grace as an excuse for sin. All of that, it rests on one thing. It rests on the reality of the fact that I haven't understood the depth of sin. I haven't understood that. I was upset at one time as a young man. I went and spoke to a, a minister, a pastor, and and I shared with him that I was angry about something. And then I, he said, you know, you're going to need to forgive him. And I said, I, I can't do that. I can't do that. I won't. He said, you have to. I said, I'm not going to. I'm not. I'm, gonna, I, I'm angry and I'm not ready to forgive. He said, God forgave you, David. And my response was, that's his job. Isn't that cool? What an idiot. But I did say that because that's where my head was at. That's his job. And he looked at me. Thank God he's an older man. I was a young man at the time. Thank God he was an older man who looked at me with wisdom and he shared with me some things that I walked out with and it changed my whole life. It's not his job. He does so because he loves you. And love covers a multitude of sin. And God can give you the ability to let go of that which is going to kill you. And you can yield to that. But you need to understand something. God is holy and God hates sin. And the wounds of Jesus Christ reveal the depth of what sin is and God's reaction to it. Habakkuk 1.13, an Old Testament prophet, Habakkuk writes, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. 
Job 15, verse 14 says, What is man that he could be pure? And he who is born of a woman that he could be righteous. You see, the wounds of Christ reveal how terrible sin really is. You see, God is a just judge. He does that which is right. And in God's economy, the punishment will always fit the crime. Therefore, imagine the depth of sin where it would require God's Son to die on our behalf. That shows me how deep sin really is. That shows me the kind of price that is necessary to cover something like that. And so when Jesus says, look at my wounds, it, it's another way of saying, one, God has demonstrated his great love for you, but two, God has demonstrated to you how terrible sin really is when you look at me. You see, in Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5, Isaiah said, Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. God's love was demonstrated to you and to me. God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so when Jesus is there and he's saying, behold and, and handle, you can see these wounds and, and you need to understand the depth of God's love for you and what he was willing to do to, to draw you to himself. That's intended to cause us to have a greater love and appreciation for him. Now, now John tells us in chapter 19, verse 20, that the, uh, the reaction of the disciples were, were that they were glad when they saw the Lord. God did this thing and, and brought a joy in them. Now, I want to take you to John chapter 19 for a moment. Please turn there again. We're going to look together in John 19, and I'm going to share a few things with you. John chapter 19. I'm sorry, John chapter 20. Verse uh, 24. Now Thomas called the twin. One of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We've seen the Lord. And so he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands. Reach your hand here, put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, I wanted to point something out to you here in this passage here. And when, when the name Thomas is mentioned, I mean, there's a word that we normally use before we say Thomas. What is that word? Doubting Thomas, right? That's what he's... How would you like to be called that, you know, doubting with your name there, doubting, doubting David, you know? I, I, don't, I, I don't like the idea. And, and yet, what we have is we have a man who is known by a different name. He's known as Doubting Thomas. I don't see him as doubting Thomas. Now, perhaps I'm just not sophisticated enough theologically to see this. What, what I call him is disappointed Thomas. Now, I can, I can relate to that. He was disappointed. This was a man who loved the Lord Jesus Christ very dearly, but he didn't understand the ways of the Lord yet. This man didn't have depth yet. He loved the Lord, but he didn't have a depth in his relationship with him. On one occasion... It's found in John's Gospel, chapter 14, 
Jesus had said, where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? You see, we all know Jesus' answer. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. But we fail to remember that the reason Jesus said that he was the way is because Thomas said, we don't know the way. And so Jesus said, listen, we're not talking about a road. We're talking about a person. We're not talking about certain things. We're talking about the fact that I am those things that you're seeking. I am life. I am truth. I am that way. And so we thank God for Thomas' statement because that gives to us the clarity of Jesus' pronouncement. You can't have a relationship with God without a relationship with him. Thomas was a man... As you see him in Scripture, who had a loyalty and a love for Jesus Christ, when Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, it was Thomas who said, let us go with him so that we might die with him. He was a man who was willing to put his life on the line for Jesus Christ. But something had happened. He was disappointed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Something had happened. Jesus had died. And now Thomas is, is, is trying to find a place to to have sorrow, a sorrow that he, that he is experiencing. And, and here's his problem. He wants to experience his sorrow, apparently, in privacy. So the news that Jesus is alive is too good to be true. Jesus didn't turn out to be what he had believed him to be, and so he's hurt. He's deeply disappointed. And that leads to a great mistake. The mistake is this. It's something that we can do too. That's why I wanted to present this to you tonight. He withdrew from fellowship and he left himself isolated. He isolated himself from comfort and he isolated himself from encouragement. And one of the worst things that believers do, and believers do this all the time, is when they're hurt or disappointed, they isolate themselves. They withdraw. I see it all the time. When they're hurt or disappointed, what do believers do? Do they go to a friend or a family member who loves the Lord? Do they say, can you please pray for me? Overwhelmingly, what they do is they escape into isolation. They do it all the time. I see this as the most common thing that I see. You know, when uh, all of us, I'm sure, have, well, maybe not all of us, have had a dog as a pet, not your best friend, that dog, not your friend, the dog, but a dog, a real dog. I had a dog named, he had a very masculine name, Corky. <laughs> and whenever my dog was hurt, he would withdraw. If he injured himself, he'd withdraw. He'd go into a corner. They withdraw into corners, they'll withdraw so they can heal. That's what they do. But what happens if you try and get close to that dog when the dog is hurt? What happens if you reach your hand in there to try and pull them out of whatever it is that they've crept into? You're going to get bitten because they don't want anything near them until they're healed. That's what dogs do. We know that. That's what animals do. When an animal gets hurt, when a dog gets hurt, what's a dog do? dog withdraws. It goes into a corner, and you can't reach it. You can't get to it. You have to leave it alone. You bring them some water, bring them some food, let them heal, and then eventually they come out. They're okay. Don't try and pick them up. Don't try and pull them out. You're going to have a fight in your hands because dogs have a tendency of withdrawing when they're in pain. We're not dogs, and yet we do the same thing. Somebody hurts my feelings. Somebody causes me great pain, and what's the first thing I do? I withdraw. I go into isolation. I put a wall around me, and I don't want anybody to try and break in there. I want to be left alone. Just give me a moment to gather my thoughts. Leave me alone. Now, of course, there is a certain point where if you've been in shock, if some great pain has hit you, you do need a moment at least to gather yourself. But when you isolate yourself and remain isolated, that's a very bad thing because what happens is you don't have somebody coming who can put their arm around you and say, listen, I don't understand what you're going through. I, I, I don't. But I can tell you this, there is one who does understand, and I'm going to lift you to the Lord, and I'm going to pray for you, and I just want you to know I'm praying for you. Sometimes, in my own life, having somebody that is sincerely praying for me has been a very, very important thing, but also having somebody there who at least is close enough for me to see has been very important too, because the hand of the Lord has been used oftentimes through the hand of a friend. That's how it works. 
Thomas made a mistake. Thomas withdrew himself. Thomas was in isolation. So he wasn't present when the Lord Jesus Christ made his appearance. He wasn't there. He wasn't part of it where Jesus came and gave them the joy of seeing him. He was not there. He withdrew. You see, Jesus' death was so brutal, it left him shocked. And, and it was going to take more than a simple testimony to convince him. He, he saw what had happened. He had seen Jesus die. And, and though they're telling him, we've seen, we've seen the Lord, in verse 21, the other, verse 25, the other disciples therefore said to him, we've seen the Lord. He, he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. I saw how he died, and just because you're telling me you saw him doesn't convince me otherwise. Well, so, verse 26, after eight days, his disciples were again inside, Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, stood in the midst, said, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here, and look at my hands, reach your hand here, put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus does not rebuke him. Jesus simply offers him proof. Jesus met Thomas at his point of weakness. That's something that I've learned to love about the Lord Jesus Christ. He meets me at the point of my weakness. He meets me where I'm at so that he can take me to where he is. And that's what he did with Thomas. He ministered to Thomas where Thomas was, and that's how he'll minister to you. See, I believe very, very deeply. I, I believe very deeply in, in being honest with the Lord. I, I believe in saying, Lord Jesus I will be respectful to you and reverential to you as I speak to you. I'm not going to accuse you of anything, but at the same time, I'd like you to know where my heart is. This is where I am. This is how I feel. This is what's going on. God, I'm sorry because I know I'm wrong. I know enough Scripture to know that I am wrong. I know I'm wrong in what I'm feeling right now. I know I'm wrong in what I'm thinking right now. I know I'm wrong in what I have done. I know that. I know I'm responding wrong. And yet, Lord, at the same time, I have to be honest with you. Let's begin where I'm at. This is where I am. Lord, in Jesus' name, would you please help me to get out of this to be where you would have me to be? I don't want to remain here. You see, Christianity to me is more than a philosophy. It's a relationship with a living God who understands. A God who has an ear that's open into my cry, somebody that I can actually speak to. I, I, and my prayer, it's not some rote prayer. It's not some memorized prayer. It's not something that somebody once said and therefore I repeat after him. The prayer is, is, is open from the heart and this is where I'm at, Lord, and, and, and I'm asking you to help me in this. And, and, and God will meet you right where you're at. I think sometimes people are afraid to just be open and honest with the Lord. All you need to do is read the Psalms and see how many times the psalmist will, will speak openly about where they're at and how they're feeling. And it's not, they're not always beautiful and, and pretty and, and, and clean prayers. I mean, there are times when the psalmist will say, oh, don't I hate those who hate you, O Lord. Smite them and break their teeth. What a lovely prayer. But, <laughs> but they say, he says what he's, he's speaking his heart to the Lord. He's saying things to God. And, and God is big enough to be able to hear them and understand. Sometimes what you say may be may appear to somebody else as even being disrespectful, and sometimes perhaps it is to the Lord. But I, I think that the Lord sees through that. He will correct you. There were times when my kids would say something to me inappropriately. They'd say it in the wrong way. And uh, they didn't do it very often. But kids do. They'll say what's on their mind. I gave them permission to do that, speak what's on your mind, but be respectful. Well, sometimes they would say the wrong word, the way they'd say it wrong. And I'd look at them, and I'd say to them, I understand your heart, I understand what you're saying, but I want you to rethink the way you're saying it because it's inappropriate, it's disrespectful, and 
rethink it. Don't speak to me that way. I'm your father. But I do understand what you're saying. And I, and I hear what you're saying. I believe that the Lord does something similar. You'll just say, God, this is how I feel. And the Lord will say, one way or another, he'll say, I hear you. I hear your cry. I understand you. I'm meeting you right there. But I'm going to bring you to a place where you can express yourself better than that because you're bordering on disrespect with me. I believe the Lord does that. I have no doubt that he does that. Thomas said, listen, unless I put my hands into his wounds, I will not believe. You can believe what you want. I saw him die. I saw the brutality. I simply refuse to believe. So what does the Lord do? He, appro he approaches Thomas and he says, you want to put your hands into my wounds? Here I am. Do it. I'm meeting you where you're at. Now, when he does that, Thomas answers him in verse 28, my Lord and my God. This isn't a, a, a statement of surprise. This is a declaration of faith. You are my God. You are my Lord. And it's interesting how that Jesus affirms this declaration. He even pronounces a blessing on him for saying that, Thomas, because you've seen me, you've believed? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You see, we walk by faith, not by sight. We didn't live during the time of the writing of the New Testament. We live centuries later. We walk by faith, not by sight. We haven't had the opportunity to see the risen Christ. We haven't ever challenged him that we might put our hands into his wounds. We have simply received the testimony that Jesus Christ is alive. And that's what Jesus is saying. Thomas, you saw, you believe. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. He's speaking about us. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, the apostle said, Whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. You haven't seen him physically. You haven't walked with him on those dusty roads. You haven't been seated with him at a table eating a meal with him. You didn't hear his, his words as he spoke and pronounced them, not physically. I haven't. I haven't seen him, but I love him. And I haven't seen him, but I believe him. And I'm blessed, and you are blessed for that. And so, the Lord will meet you where you're at, and he will take you to where he is. He did that with Thomas, and he was doing that with these people. And, and I'll close with this. Back in, in chapter uh, 24, verses 41 and 40, through 43, where it says, while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said, have you any food here? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, some honeycomb. He took it and ate in their presence, demonstrating to them that indeed he wasn't a spirit. He was alive in a physical body, and he's present with them. And though we haven't seen him physically, we believe in him. And though we have not seen him and walked with him in that way, we love him. I pray that we love him. I pray that we love him. I've asked the Lord for many years to teach me to love, but I especially want to learn to love him, to love the Lord with all of my heart, and I can't help but love the Lord. But you know what excites me is I've been with my wife for many, many years, and I love her more every day. And it excites me because I've been with the Lord for many, many years, and I'm learning to love the Lord more every day. He has been so good to us, guys. He has been so good to us. He forgave us of all our sins. He, he cleansed us from all our unrighteousness. He, he took our sins that we had upon himself 
and he's forgiven us. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he cast our sins from us. There's no way that they'll ever be brought to his remembrance, recovered by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm at one with him through Christ. I have a relationship with God. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Heaven is my home. I'm just passing through. God has been good. And God is going to be even better to us every day. We just trust him. Just hold fast to him. Just love him. You're his kid. You know, my kids will come to me sometimes and they're in need. I don't, I'm not one of these dads who say, well, you know, I hope you can figure out how you're going to get out of that mess. What I try to do is I try to help them to get out of that mess, whatever it may be. And if necessary, I'll get involved in that mess with them. I'll just get in that mess with them. You know, there have been many times in my life where I've asked the Lord, whatever it is that they're going through, please put it on me. Just put it on me. You know, because because I love them. And the Lord did that for me because what I was going through, he put on Jesus for me. How can I not love him? How can you not love him after all that he's done for you?